everyone. Thank you for joining us for the National Eating Disorders Association's Parent, Family, and Friends webinar series. Today we are presenting Mirror, Mirror, Standards of Beauty, Body Image, and the Media. My name is Ellen Domingos. I'm the Community Outreach Specialist here at NIDA. And we're so excited to have with us today two amazing presenters. And I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce one of them. Melanie Klein is a writer, speaker, and sociology and women's studies professor at Santa Monica College. He has worked with the New Citizen Journalists of the LA Academy of Global Girl Media and the peer educators of Joint Advocates on Disordered Eating on ways to tap into the power of their own voice. He is an expert contributor in the areas of media literacy and body image issues for Proud to Be Me. He is on the founding board of the Brave Girls Alliance, the advisor of the Santa Monica College Leadership Alliance, and the founder and co-coordinator of Women Action and Media Los Angeles. He founded FeministFatale.com and is a contributor to Adios Barbie, Elephant Journal, Intent.com, Mind Body Green, and Ms. Magazine's blog. Her co-edited anthology with Anna Guest Jelly, Yoga and Body Image, is due out on October 2014. Hi, Melanie. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Great. And next we have Roy A. Kui. He's a Los Angeles native, father of two boys and one girl, stepfather to one boy and one girl, and a Photoshop professional. For the last 15 years plus, he has been enhancing images for the covers of style and fashion magazines, beauty and fashion brands, ad agencies for high-profile campaigns, and for world-renowned commercial and fine art photographers. After attending a screening of the documentary film Misrepresentation, Roy became more aware of how his media work contributes to how his daughters, girls, and women perceive themselves. He has started to expose the secrets of image manipulation within the print and advertising industries. His mission is to help women, as well as men, realize the imagery that they are bombarded with on a daily basis is designed to make consumers feel inadequate for financial gain. He is currently working as a Photoshop professional and no longer as a digital retoucher. The difference? As a Photoshop professional, he doesn't work in the beauty and fashion industries any longer, but is now in product and design and without negatively impacting consumers' self-esteem. Roy is actively pursuing a career in voice acting so that he can stop working in the image manipulation business altogether. So hi, Roy. Thank you so much for being here as well. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Great. So I just want to briefly go over the agenda that um, uh, topics we'll be discussing. And Melanie's going to start us off um, with talking a little bit about uh, our relationship with the mirror. Um, and then she'll go on to media images, uh, body image and cultivation theory, uh, tell us a bit about media literacy education. And then Roy will give us a demonstration, a little Photoshop 101 lesson. And uh, back to Melanie to wrap it up. So at this time, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Melanie Klein. Thank you so much. We're all familiar with the following phrase from one of the most famous fairy tales that most of us, girls and boys, grow up reading. And that is that famous line, as the queen looks in the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And that is a sort of mantra that she repeats day in and day out to really have the mirror who's all seeing affirm that she is indeed the fairest or the most beautiful in the land. And I remember reading that story, I don't know, two, three, four years old, that it was one of the many fairy tales in the pantheon of fairy tales that girls are given that begins to shape our perception of what it means to be a girl or a woman growing up in this culture. And because it was something that I started to hear and something that I had 
my parents read to me at such a young age, I never really questioned its validity, and I never really questioned the kind of message or the values that it was imparting. It was just something that had been so normative and normal to hear in my life that as I got older and I really started to think about what that was teaching, not just that line, but that message all throughout the pop culture is that really the most important thing and the highest sort of aspiration that any girl or woman can have is to be the most beautiful, right? To be physically attractive. And we all know how this particular story ends up. We know that eventually one day the mirror confirms that there is another girl much younger than the queen who is in fact now the most beautiful in the land and she actually goes out to destroy her. She has a henchman go out to try to kill her and bring back her heart. Um, and again, I didn't really think so much about it as a child, but that's a pretty strong message that to pursue this sort of, you know, standard of beauty um, that in this particular story it was so important, it gave the queen such a great sense of worth that she would be actually willing to go um, put this other girl to death. So I like to start off with this because, you know, we spend a lot of time looking in the mirror and when we consider the kind of culture that we live in now that's so heavily mediated, my question's just been, what are we actually seeing, and what informs what we're seeing in the mirror? And so what I decided to do when I started teaching women's studies about 11 years ago is the assignment that I really introduced these concepts with is a mirror exercise. I have my students go home, and they're instructed to look at themselves in the mirror for a half an hour. The first 15 minutes, they're instructed to look in the mirror full length with their clothes on. And then the timer sounds, and in the next 15 minutes, they're instructed to look in the mirror with their clothes off, to not do anything, to not create any lists, not to get distracted, but to actually gaze at their reflection for a full half hour with their clothes on and off, and then to write about the experience and to write about what they see. I wanted to know, what do you see when you look in the mirror? What are they fo focusing on? What do they notice? What are they obsessing over? And what kinds of conversations are they having with themselves? And in those 11 years, I have taught this class and had them do this particular exercise, I would say approximately 35 times. And there has been a really distinct pattern that has begun to develop, so much so that I started to take all of these assignments and I've had research assistants begin to take that qualitative data and begin to log it, to begin to actually show how year after year, semester after semester, person after person, there's a very clear pattern that begins to develop. And the pattern that has, I have found over the year is the primary thing, the first thing that they say that they notice when they look in the mirror are their, quote, flaws. And I found that so interesting, right, to begin to see that this pattern developed mostly among women and girls, but certainly among the men in my classes as well, that in that half hour that they spent looking at themselves, what was really the most striking to them was this idea that there were things that needed to be fixed, that there were parts of their body that needed to be improved. And because I had them write about that, and you know, having all of this qualitative of data, they really got to write about this feeling of like, oh, my nose is too long, or my breasts are too small, or my breasts are too saggy, or my arms aren't muscular enough, or oh, I need to spend more time at the gym, or I need to lose another five pounds. There were so many different ways that this notion of flaws manifested in their writing. And so in talking about this idea that there were things that needed to be fixed, that there were things that needed to be improved, and hearing this time and time again, the next logical question for me was, okay, if you're focusing on your flaws, and I put them in quotes, right, well, how do we even define what a flaw is? How do we, where does that notion come from? In order to look at yourself or look at someone else and say, this needs to be fixed, this isn't good, or this is bad, this is unattractive, this needs to be fixed, or this needs to be improved. We have to have some framework of reference. 
And so I always like to ask, well, if you see that as a flaw, where's that idea coming from? How can you even begin to define that as a flaw? And what always comes out that in order to define something as a flaw, we have to have a standard of comparison. We have to be comparing ourselves against something else in order to have some sort of default setting of this is right and this is good, and I deviate from that particular pattern, or I deviate from that particular template. And overwhelmingly, what we found is the comparisons that were being made that informed their sense of what is good or bad about their bodies were the images derived in the media. Now, that, of course, isn't the only place that we get our idea of what is beautiful or what is good or what is bad or what is perfect or what needs to be fixed. Of course, we also get these ideas in our families, right, especially um, for girls and women from the women in their families, right? What are the sort of conversations mothers are having about their own bodies? How are mothers and older siblings, you know, treating their bodies? Um, how do they define what is beautiful or attractive? So, of course, it's our families, our peer groups, and at school, right? But overwhelmingly, in the culture that we live in today, most of the ideas that we get about what is attractive, or what is considered to be beautiful, what is considered to be valuable, comes from the media environment and the mediated images that we're taking in day in and day out. And so the, the question for me becomes, OK, so if we are defining this as a flaw, then well, what are the consequences of doing that? What are the consequences of making these comparisons of ourselves against these mediated messages? How does that manifest in our self-esteem? How does that manifest in our relationship with ourselves? How does that manifest in our relationship with others? And research shows time and time again that there are endless consequences that are negative and harmful, if not toxic, for women and girls, and increasingly boys and men, who have begun to define their bodies as good or bad, perfect or flawed, in comparison to these images. First of all, as Nita talks about time and time again in their work, is that there are physical consequences, right? This can lead to disordered eating, to clinical eating disorders, to over-exercise. Um, oftentimes, these things include the use of laxatives, binging and purging, calorie restriction, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to physical consequences, right, there's also emotional and psychological consequences. But there's also the impact on our self-esteem, our sense of worth, um, the way that we allow ourselves to be treated, and the way that we treat ourselves. One of the most striking things for me um, in talking about you know, some of these consequences is the fact that the dialogue that occurs when we're in front of the mirror, right, um, it's just one of them, that we have this really negative, toxic self-speak that we engage in. Oftentimes, it's now called fat talk, right? And if anybody were to be having those sorts of conversations with anyone else, that would be considered to be a dysfunctional or an abusive relationship. Yet time and time again, as we take in these images and we're comparing ourselves to those images and seeing ourselves as flawed, we also begin to berate ourselves and denigrate ourselves and to speak to ourselves in a way that, again, is really, really toxic and begins to have an impact on our psyche, our emotional state, and our self-esteem. The other way that these images are really harmful to us is that all of the sort of um, torturous rituals all right, that women and girls and increasingly boys and men begin to engage in, how often we hear people say, oh, I was so sick, I had the flu for like 10 days, but I lost 15 pounds, right? That we're willing to go to these extreme lengths to, uh, that are really damaging in order to meet this elusive ideal that oftentimes manifests in you know, weight or numbers. Um, we know that many models have admitted to, and actresses as well, is starting to smoke cigarettes okay, as a way to maintain their appetites, that they're actually willing to forego their health. I mean, we know research shows right, that smoking kills and causes cancer, but yet there is so much stake and there's so much weight being put on 
meeting this particular beauty standard, which is so myopic, which is so one-dimensional, which is so homogenous, and is so difficult to achieve, that we are put into a position that we're willing to actually put our health at risk. Not to mention all of the supplements that individuals are taking, right? And this includes men, especially men. I have a friend who a couple years ago um, almost died of liver failure. He was hospitalized for several months. Um, he ended up having hepatitis as a result of his liver failure, completely jaundiced and yellow. And what had caused his liver failure, they actually had begun end-of-life care for him. And his wife was, they were planning his funeral, is uh, he had been taking workout supplements um, in order to get larger, to become more muscular. And those supplements are not regulated very often. And as a result, there were all of these chemicals and additives put in that weren't even legal in this country, um, but they were selling this at GNC, and he had been taking these in order for him as a man to meet the ideal of the muscular um, male, and he ended up having liver failure. Now, he ended up living, but, I mean, that was a really close call, and people don't talk about all of these supplements and all of these additives um, that are even used, like from creatine to fat burners that that these are chemicals that we're putting in our body and that don't actually enhance our state of health. They are solely done in the pursuit of vanity and the pursuit of this beauty ideal that has been depicted and informs our standard of what is attractive. And then as we see that we are some way failing or there's something missing or that there's something wrong, that we put ourselves at risk in order to meet that ideal. We also know that Research shows that um, the self-esteem of girls and women um, plummets in response to these images. We also know that these images increase the rates of depression among girls and women. So there are endless emotional, psychological, and physical costs, and that doesn't even begin to attack right, the diet industry and the cosmetics industry that just like all of the supplements and additives, are actually have been found to have tons of carcinogens in them. Um, makeup for women and all of the products that we use oftentimes have paraben or other additives that have been linked to breast cancer or to other um, harmful diseases and illnesses in the body. Um, so the cosmetics industry and the diet industry also, just through the use of these products that we believe may potentially lead us to a place where we can meet that standard of beauty on top of everything else also really puts us at great risk. So there's no doubt that the standard of beauty that we are seeing in the media is attainable for very few, right? So that standard of beauty that is constantly being depicted is not one that is available to everyone. It is a standard of beauty that is, you know, incredibly, incredibly myopic. And what we're seeing time and time again is that the same body types, the same races, right, are constantly shown, and that most people in the culture don't actually meet those criteria. Um, that's not to say that there is anything inherently wrong with the body types that we see and things of that nature. It just means that it's not actually representative of most of the population. I believe the statistic is that the body type that we see 99.9% .9 of the time actually represents anywhere from 3 to 5% of women in the population. So the problem is that it's incredibly confining. It's a very, very narrow standard of beauty. Which leads me to talk about, well, haven't we always had standards of beauty? And we have, right? We have always had standards of beauty that have operated in the culture. The thing is, not only have standards of beauty changed, but also the media's depiction and the media's presentation of beauty has changed. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to really investigate that, because I think it's really important. Because as little girls and women and boys and men, when we are exposed to a standard of beauty time and time again, it begins to seem normal to us. It's not exceptional. We expect it. And what we have to understand is that standards of beauty are created in relationship to the social, political, and economic context that we're in. And that social, political, and economic context is subject to change. 
which means that our standards of beauty are subject to change. Obviously, if we take a historical look at the women and the men that have been considered attractive, we find that there is no uniform sense of beauty standards, that these beauty standards change. Simultaneously, at any given period of time, we can make cross-cultural comparisons and find that standards of beauty are not the same culture to culture. So for example, in the United States, uh, breast size <laughs> and breasts are a huge focus um, in terms of what makes a woman attractive. And we know that we have incredibly high rates of uh, breast implants, more so than we had 20 years ago, more so than we had 40 years ago, and more so than they have in Brazil. Because in Brazil, breasts are not the hot body part. It's your butt is the hot body part, right? And so unsurprisingly, the uh, amount of breast augmentation in Brazil is much lower than it is in the United States. Simultaneously, the focus on breasts is a fairly new phenomenon in the history of our own culture. And as what we find is that there is a correlation between that focus to breast enhancement. Um, even before we had plastic surgery, right, there was padding use, things of that nature. Breasts have not always been the focal point. There were times in history that a woman's hands or uh, the nape of a woman's neck or her waist, which is why oftentimes they were corseted down to 13 inches. The point being that our standards of beauty are not inherent. They're not natural. These are social constructions, and they change. And we can see how we went from you know, uh, small-breasted women in the 1920s, very androgynous, so much so that women tape down their breasts, to moving into the 1950s where the hourglass figure, very curvy, a very soft silhouette. You know, there was not a lot of muscle tone. As we move into the 60s and 70s where sort of the, you know, the stick figure, the twiggy is very popular, very few curves, very, very thin. And then we move later on and we continue into the 1980s we see that the toned body is attractive, right? We see buns of steel, abs of steel, and this focus on not only should you be thin, but you should be toned is something new as women begin to make changes, right, and moving into a male-dominated workforce. And then we move on. We have heroin chic in the 90s, so on and so forth. The point being that every single one of those standards was informed by the social, political, and economic context that they were in. So beauty standards have changed. They are not the same. And when we talk about the media's relationship to beauty, we also have to understand that that has changed. The media in its current form is very, very new. We don't even have television invented until 1942. So prior to 1942, the images of beauty that we were shown primarily came through magazines and newspapers. Okay? We certainly did, them, did not have them all around us. We didn't have moving figures. And so the media, the actual forms of media that we've used, have changed our relationship to these standards of beauty. First of all, we are inundated with more images of beauty than we have ever been inundated before. Okay? That while standards of beauty have always existed, we have never been flooded with images the way that we have been flooded today. It is very rare for us to go about our day and not have our eyes rest on a mediated image almost every moment of the day. Well, that was just something that didn't happen in the early 90s, in the 1970s, in the 1950s, in the 1920s. And while each of those eras had standards of beauty, we were not subject to those standards of beauty to the degree that we are today. The other thing that has changed is that while standards of beauty have always existed, the media places so much focus okay, on the beauty standard that it really has surpassed any other quality, talent, or skill that women may have. So Joan Jacobs Brumberg wrote a really incredible book called The Body Project, An Intimate History of American Girls, and she points out that she took primary sources, a lot of the diaries of, of young women at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, and she used them as primary sources to see what their relationships were with their bodies. 
And what she found is that the pursuit of beauty, right, the pursuit of beauty standards had always been there, right? They had always had a variety of body projects, if you will. But what was very different is that it was not the sole sense of their identity. It was not the sole determinant of their worth, meaning many of these young girls would write about how important it was to be charitable, how important it was to be active in the church or in the community. Um, they were oftentimes measured on, you know, were they a good seamstress, or were they kind, or did they bake a bomb ASS cake, okay? That there were other ways for women to be valued. What we have found is with the media's incessant focus on beauty is that women are primarily measured by how attractive they are, how closely they can emulate or obtain which what we've already pointed out, a very narrow myopic standard of beauty that is statistically unattainable by the masses, okay? So that's another huge change, is that not only are we bombarded with more images than we've ever been bombarded before, but that they have a much greater role in shaping our sense of identity and self-worth and the way that we're viewed by the culture, the kind of value that we have to the culture. And lastly, the other way that this really you know, interrelated relationship between the media and beauty has changed over time is that not only are we you know, more bombarded, not only are we much more mediated, not only do we see beauty taking a greater role, but the images themselves are, <laughs> are manipulated. That the images that we are now taking in, in mass, in ways that we have never taken in before, have been digitally altered to a degree that the standard of beauty that we're exposed to is not even real. It's not even something physically possible. And oftentimes we'll hear celebrities or models speak out and say, I don't even look like that, meaning I don't even look like the picture of myself. That the picture has been so drastically altered, you know, making legs smaller, making breasts larger, um, you know, making someone's skin lighter, that the person who actually posed for the photograph in real life does not even look like the photo that is supposedly representing her, and most importantly, informing everyone's standards of beauty. And if you recall, coming full circle, when we look in the mirror and we're making comparisons, right, to the images that we're seeing and pointing out, oh, this is flawed, this needs changed, the most insidious part about the whole thing is that we are making comparisons and we are identifying our flaws based on a standard of beauty that isn't just one-dimensional, it doesn't even exist. It is not real. It is the result of the magic of computer retouching, which we'll be getting into um, later in the webinar. So moving on, if we're talking about body image, that's ultimately what's happening here is that our body image is being impacted by all of these images and all of these experiences that we're having in the culture. Body image is what we see when we look in the mirror, right? When we are seeing the flaws, when we're seeing the things that need to be fixed, what's really being reflected back is not the reality of what our bodies look like. What we're seeing is our body image being reflected. And a body image was a term first coined by a psychologist, Dr. Schilder, in the 1930s. And body image refers to the psychological blueprint that we have. It is the psychological image that we have of what we look like. And that psychological image is constructed from everything to your mother telling you, oh, honey, maybe you'd have a boyfriend if you'd lose 10 pounds, or oh, sweetie, do you really want to eat that? Your thighs are getting a little large, to being teased on the playground for being too short, for being too tall, for being too skinny, for being too large, for being too pimply, for being too dimply, to the media images that we're taking in, which is obviously the focus of this webinar. So that's our body image. It's not actually real, meaning what we're seeing in the mirror is probably very different than how other people see us. In fact, very often, to really demonstrate this idea is that if you were to imagine someone like you walking down the street, usually what happens is we find that we're much more critical of ourselves 
than someone else who might look like us. That because what we're seeing in many ways is very distorted. The mirror has distortions in it. It's almost like a fun house mirror. We don't see that when we look at other people, but all those experiences have changed, right, our psychological blueprint of what we look like, and that's our body image. Another example that I can give from my own life, <laughs> many years ago when I was about 17, I remember looking in the mirror, and I turned around because I was wearing a pair of really short jean shorts with lace trim at the bottom. Yeah, I just dated myself, I know, but they were. Jean shorts with lace trim at the bottom it was like 1991, and I was rocking it, looking in the mirror, and I called in my boyfriend, and I said, hey, Dave, Dave, um, have I gained weight? And I could see the look on his face like, oh, no, she didn't just ask me that. It's like that dreaded question. You can never win in answering that question. And, you know, a lot of people think when women or girls say, oh, do I look good? Do I look fat in this? That they're looking for some kind of acknowledgement that, no, hey, you really look good. I think a lot of people don't realize when that question is being asked, they're asking because they really don't know what they look like. I can attest to the fact that when I looked in the mirror and I called him in, I could not tell what I looked like. I really, my frame of reference was so distorted that I could not tell and I needed him to help me, but he was so petrified in asking me because he knew it was a highly taboo and sensitive subject. I probably spent that day, it stands out, 30 minutes in front of the mirror trying to figure out if my butt was bigger, smaller, or the same as it had been the day before. That's an example of how our body image is so manipulated, so distorted by all these things that happen to us. We have a very difficult time actually having an authentic vision of what we look like. And so if we understand that our body image in large part is shaped by the media environment that we're in, I like to talk about what's called cultivation theory. Cultivation theory is an idea that was created by George Gerbner, who worked for the Annenberg School of Communication for over 40 years. He did um, research on media characters, media representation, and he talked about cultivation theory as the building and maintenance of a stable set of images. And that idea, the building and maintenance of a stable set of images, really goes back to an idea that I presented during the last slide and that has to do with the volume of images that we see. It has to do with the ubiquitous nature of the media landscape that we're in. That when people wonder why we're critiquing imagery as if it doesn't matter, we have to explain it's not that one image that matters. What matters is that this one image or this one particular theme or this one particular body type that these are images and patterns and themes that are reproduced over and over and over and over again. That is cultivation theory, the repetitive and prolific nature of the images that we see over and over again, so much so that they no longer seem extraordinary, so much so that they no longer seem unusual or exceptional. So for example, we are more likely to notice a deviation from the pattern than to actually notice the pattern itself. So if we're looking through a magazine, we may see um, white, thin, tall woman over white, thin, tall woman over and over and over again. And it doesn't even, we don't even stop and go, oh, look, look how many tall, white, thin, white women we're seeing over and over, because we expect to see tall, thin, white women over and over again. But then when you see someone, for example, like Lupita at the Oscars, or if we are thinking about the young actress Gabrielle Cibode in Precious, we're going, oh, wow, wow, she's really a deviation. Look at, see, what's everybody talking about? There's diversity. Look at that one actress. Look at that one model. Or, hey, look, this ad shows diversity. Look, there's a woman who's a size 10. What we have to point out, yeah, you're going to notice the deviation from the norm. But the ratio to images or patterns that deviate from the norm to the pattern itself is not even comparable. We are much more likely to be impacted by the taken for granted repetitive norm than we are to be impacted by the one image that deviates. That's cultivation theory. This is not cause and effect, right? This is about stability. 
This refers to the fact that from the time that we're born, we're essentially mediated, right? From the moment that children are born and they are being raised, they are exposed to media messages, even if their parents don't have them watch television in the home. Because all throughout the culture, we are being exposed to mediated messages. So what that means is there's no cause and effect. There's no independent variable creating a change in the way that we feel. What's happening is there is the cultivation of these images and ideas. There is this normative application through the sheer repetition and volume of images that we're seeing, which means that it's creating a framework of reference. It is actually beginning to take shape in our minds in the ways that we feel about ourselves, in the ways that we feel about and potentially judge others, our expectations, right, our dreams, our desires are all shaped in that particular framework. Research shows that the average amount of screen time, we're talking television, phones, computers, the average amount of screen time that an adult has today is 8.5 hours a day. 8.5 hours a day, that's a full-time job, okay? We also know that in the last 30 years, the amount of advertisements which are programmed to sell, right, that are programmed to create desire in us in order to profit, that we are now seeing 5,000 ads a day, a day, and that is up from 2,000 ads a day just 30 years ago. We also know that when you begin to look at children, right, that they are being mediated in much greater numbers than ever before. Um, the research that I had been looking at recently showed that 8 to 18-year-olds are have moved in the last few years from five and a half hours to seven and a half hours of screen time a day. And those seven and a half hours actually translate to 10 hours and 45 minutes because they're media multitasking, meaning they might be listening to music at the same time that they're on the computer or they're playing a video game, but there's music playing as well. So media multitasking takes these seven and a half hours and actually inflates it to 10 hours and 45 minutes a day. So when we consider that we are mediated in such large doses, cultivation theory makes sense. It means that there is nothing that comes in and changes our mind rather that we are exposed to media images in such a large degree, seeing the same images, the same standards of beauty, the same bodies, the same races, the same plot lines, the same stereotypes, over and over again, that we don't even question them. We just think that they're natural. We think that they're inevitable. So that is, I mean, an incredible way to look at our body image and understand that what we're looking at when we're looking in the mirror is the result of a continuous assault, right, on our own perception of the world. And this is where media literacy education comes in. Media literacy education um, was started about 35, 35 years ago. And there was the recognition at that time, I mean, and so we're talking about in about the 1980s, late 80s, that if we look at the media landscape in the late 80s, it was nothing like the media landscape that we have today. There was no Tumblr. There was no Instagram with all of its filters. There was no Facebook. There were no digital cameras. None of that was around. But there was already the keen understanding that our cultural landscape was being increasingly mediated and that the foundation of the media is the advertising industry, and that the sole interest of the advertising industry is to create profit. And you can create profit when you can create need and desire. And most of that is predicated on the idea that there's something wrong with you that needs to be fixed, which is why you need this product or service. So if we understand that advertising and its aim to profit off our own insecurity is the foundation of the media, right, then we absolutely need media literacy education. Media literacy education is not anti-media, and it's not censorship. Media literacy education is designed to allow individuals to be active consumers of the media, to be conscious consumers of the media, as opposed to being pawns of the media. 
right? It's about waking up and understanding how the media operates, right? Being able to understand why it operates in a certain way. Being able to deconstruct and analyze the content that is created because it's that content that has an impact not only on our body image and our sense of self-esteem, but it is that media content that shapes our understanding of race, our understanding of class, our understanding of equality, and that if we want to be active citizens and active participants in a democracy and in our own life, we absolutely need media literacy education to give us the skills to be able to make sense of the cultural environment that is heavily mediated and that we're swimming in at all times. And with that, I think it's really important for with all of this conversation about you know, the media um, and its impact on our body image, especially understanding not only the volume and the repetitive nature of the media, but also an understanding that pretty much every image, even moving images, have been digitally altered I think it's really different for me to just talk about it as opposed to seeing it. So at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Roy so that he can actually demonstrate how images are manipulated um, in the media environment that we're living in. Hello, everybody. Um, I, here's my screen. Here we go. Um, this is actually uh, a an image that I actually retouched as a test at one point because I wanted to go ahead and test my skills early on in my retouching, uh, kind of uh, cutting of my teeth, if you will. Um, the reason why is, and I'm showing you the after at this point because this is what we usually go ahead and see when we go into a store, or any kind of uh, department store or drug store, and you look into a you know, the beauty aisle where there's makeup and everything else going on. This is what you see. And it's blown up huge. You look at this and you think, wow, this woman has beautiful skin. I wish I looked like her. You know, I just, well, maybe I have to go ahead and buy this product, whatever it is, and I'll get closer to it. Even if I'm not going to look as good as she does, if I don't have her jeans, at least I'll get closer. And the thing is that with this imagery that's going on, that you see everywhere, as Melanie was saying, it, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, is not real. Now, I just kind of retouch this one little area. I'm clicking off and on, just this little eyelash right here. If you'll look here at about 100%, we're in here. I just took a few minutes to go ahead and do that. And that's the kind of small minutia of retouching that is done to be able to go ahead and make an image look, quote unquote, perfect and be able to go ahead and provide the perfect look and a woman that has perfect beauty, which does not exist. So I'm going to show you the after now. Um, and prepare yourself. This is how she looked in the raw image. And as you see, there's all of this freckling going on, which is finally perfectly normal, perfectly healthy. Nothing wrong with it. Actually has its own kind of cuteness to it. You know, there's people that actually have a thing for freckles. But if you're in the ad agency or the um, beauty industry in general, this isn't going to fly. This is not what the ideal is, even though it might even be kind of, oh, uh, lesser than the norm, it's still, it's pretty fairly average, and they don't want that. This is what they want. This is what they want you to see. This is what they want you to believe as what is quote unquote normal or perfect. And they want you to think that you should be a little closer to normal, a little closer to perfect. And that's where I come in. And I just kind of been holding on to this image over the years, and this is the first time I've actually shown it, but it, uh, at least, to, to a mass um, audience. I've shown it to friends of mine and other colleagues and it's been kind of a, an interesting talking point. So as I was sitting here listening to Melanie, um, it's, she educated me actually in some things too. I, I, I'm merely just kind of the magician but I don't really understand a lot of how these tricks or I know how the tricks work but I don't understand the psychology behind it. And that is where um, Melanie comes in and she was really on point when just being able to go ahead and show a standard of beauty constantly, 
makes one think that that is the norm. So also with this one, let's see here, there was some issues with her eye color. That's something else I don't think that many people really realize that every part of these images, it's not just, you know, pixel by pixel we go ahead and manipulate. It can actually go ahead and be every part of the composition, the actual image itself. So it's not that I just took out her freckles. I also went ahead and whitened her eyes. So maybe you don't feel so fresh. Maybe you woke up and you, as we all do usually, woke up with some bloodshot eyes or for whatever reason, even if it's just been a regular night's sleep. And then we see these images and we're like, that seems like somebody that's happy and healthy. So maybe I should go ahead and try and maybe get some, you know, eye whitener, whatever you that, you know, the, the, the whatever kind of eye drops she would go ahead and need. So it, it extends beyond just one little part of this industry that's trying to get you to consume one particular product that actually there's a breadth. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and show you a little real time of some retouching that uh, on a very average looking young lady, I selected this image because of the fact that she did seem to be a little more in the, the, the body shape of, of normal, and not too skinny, not too overweight, just about average. Um, as I was bringing this image up and I was listening to Melanie trying to go ahead and see if there's anything else I could probably do to show a little more impact, I found myself completely retouching this image all over again. And I'll go ahead and I'll show you where I was when I first started. This is the raw image, by the way. This is unretouched. This is where I was when I came in. Just a little bit around the eyes. That was it. And I'll show you what I just did in the past what, maybe 20 minutes or so since Melanie has been talking. First off, I'll go ahead and I'll show you what we call looking at it at 100%, which is basically being able to, I'm uh, having some typical difficulties here. There we go. So now, her skin is actually pretty good considering she doesn't really have any major pock marks going on. She doesn't have any scars. She doesn't have any acne going on. Maybe she has some, uh, you know, little zits or whatever, little, little blemishes up here because of the fact that, you know, she has bangs sweat, it's hot, she works out, whatever she does, she's an active individual. Perfectly normal. But that is completely unacceptable. And when I get, or a retoucher in the beauty and fashion industry gets an image from either the ad agency or the photographer, there is an unspoken list of things that need to be done before they actually see the first round of retouching. They don't go ahead and go in there first and say, I want you to take care of this, 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 and this there is already a checklist that we know to do. And then they look at it, and then they go even further and say, okay, now I want this done, I want this done, I want this done. And that is where it kind of starts to get distorted and a little disturbing because they don't see the before. There's been times when I, they asked me, uh, the client has asked me to go ahead and show them the before, and I do, and they literally just flinch back in shock because they can't believe how far we've gotten. And this is only round three or four. So they see these little flaws on something that has already been over retouched and beautified and simplified and, and refined and look for even more small, minutia little mistakes and things that stand out as quote unquote distractions from the product. And then we end up with some very, very extreme retouching. Now I'm going to show you what I did with this what's the healing tool which a lot of people have just been finding, finding out about uh, in um, Photoshop and before that it was the healing brush, or I'm sorry, the clone tool. So those two are the ones that I use the most. First, I use the healing to go ahead and actually keep consistent the color tones and the highlights and shadows as well as mainly the texture and the skin. So then when I go ahead and use the cloning tool, I'm able to go ahead and go in and kind of smooth things out. And I'll show you right now, just really quickly in real time, how that can be very easily done. So in this case, she still has some darkness under the eyes that my clients or in the past would not go ahead and deem acceptable. I would actually probably not be hired again if I handed it to him like this. So you just kind of sample from lighter areas and you bring it in and there you go. You start to go ahead and lighten up the skin tones and kind of even them out, and she doesn't look like she had a rough night the night before. She doesn't look as unhealthy. She looks happy. 
she looks like she is a functional member of society. So you're going to want to go ahead and buy these products. Then uh, we go ahead and already have a setup action, just make some noise and texture, and boom, there you go. Maybe you might knock it back a little bit so it looks a little on opacity, so you don't, it's not full intensity. Now you get a little bit of a kind of in-between, which makes it look more quote-unquote natural. So now what happens is usually there is shaping involved. And I'm going to go ahead and show you an unshapen version of her, and I'm going to go into what's called the, I don't even know if I should tell you what it's called, but it's a special filter within Photoshop that uh, is actually called the Liquify tool. And here we go. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my computer. And here is where it's the most shocking. Usually when people think of, oh, body shaping, it's going to be some kind of sculpting, some kind of reconstruction that's involved in Photoshop or any other kind of image manipulation program that's going to take a long time. And it used to before this liquify filter came along. So to speed things up a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and come in here and I'm going to select a bigger size of the brush. And this right here is usually always the first to go. They don't like to see that. So as you see, I'm just going ahead and using this brush right here to kind of smush these pixels in just ever so slightly. And it is a very slight manipulation, but unfortunately, the impact is huge. It's virtually immeasurable only by the fact of the casualties of this imagery, which women and men that seem to go ahead and have eating disorders, uh, have body image issues that uh, really just end up hating themselves because they don't look like any of the imagery that they're bombarded with on a daily basis. So right through here as well, I would have to go ahead and kind of tuck it up a little bit, kind of bring this in here. So that way it doesn't give the illusion of an oval or a protrusion. But then not only that, but I'll have to go ahead and I would probably mask this off her arm so it wouldn't be going with her stomach right now, but time doesn't allow me to do that. But you get the idea. This is now becoming a very tight and fit and trim tummy, one that is going to be admired and, and actually coveted instead of scoffed at and laughed at and pointed at. So there we go. Let's go ahead and go back. Doesn't take long, but it just took me a few minutes, and I could go further. You know, I mean, we would go ahead and just make sure that this hairline was all nice and rounded out. But here we go, before and after. And that only took me just a couple of minutes, and I took a little bit longer because I'm babbling. So with that said, um, keep in mind that everything that you see out there has been retouched. Everything in print media has been retouched. It's not just women, it's men. It's children. It's all products that you see. Anything in print that is in magazines, in your stores, anything that you see online, uh, food and the menus, even the food and menus at restaurants and fast food places, all of those have been manipulated. I have done stuff from Asian food to burgers to fine cuisine and jewelry as well. So keep that in mind and also even cats and dogs. <laughs> so um, I hope this was a bit of an eye opener for you and I'm sure that hopefully a couple of jaws dropped and some awareness has been uh, made. And now I will go ahead and hand it back to Melanie. Thank you, Roy. I want to add a few things. Roy and I have actually had the opportunity to work together before. And one of the things that I found really striking is, as he had pointed out, um, he just worked on that one image for a couple minutes. And as he was doing it, it didn't even seem that ex extreme. And when he went from the before and after, we could see that even those minor, <laughs> air quotes, minor retouches <laughs> made a pretty drastic difference. And what I found really striking is when Roy said um, the last time we worked together that many images had been worked on for hours, hours worth of work. Mm -hmm. um, and when we consider that through the lens of cultivation theory, it really speaks to how our perception of self and how our body image is informed by the most unrealistic of images, these 
images of beauty and standards of beauty that could not ever be obtained no matter how much you dieted or how many products and services that you used, right? That it is a never-ending chase to meet this ephemeral uh, beauty ideal. One other thing is when you were doing this um, that I'll mention before I go into the official wrap-up is that we have to consider that when our whole world is informed by unreal images, reality begins to pale in comparison, right? Leading to that dissatisfaction, leading to that sort of disillusionment. And it reminded me of a study that I read several years ago, I think maybe 2006 or seven. Psychology Today had pointed out that young men who were having their first sexual encounters with women were having a harder time getting and maintaining erections because they had been, through the process of cultivation, had created an image of what a naked woman's body is supposed to look like, that when they were in bed with real women and there were stretch marks or moles or freckles or dimples, they actually were no longer sexually turned on by the real bodies that they were with. And I found that to be such a profound statement that not only do girls and women and boys and men have their own self-esteem impacted, but it's also the way that we see each other and it's the way that we see the world. And so I like to wrap up in saying that, you know, how are other ways <laughs> that we could look at our bodies? What are the other ways in which we can look in the mirror and have different re messages reflected back? How can we begin to see ourselves in a different light? Because Again, inevitably, everybody, the first thing that they said is, I focus on my flaws. And I always ask, can you, what about being grateful? What about having a sense of appreciation? How come we don't look in the mirror and really get welled with gratitude for what our bodies can do, the experiences our bodies allow us to have? I know for me, um, I have a five-year-old son. I was pretty blown away that my body could make a person that I love so much. And I was like, that's pretty amazing, <laughs> right? That my body can create human life or that, you know, my body as an able-bodied person, I'm able to walk or run or hug or make love. That we have some pretty profound experiences available to us through these vessels that carry us through our life but we spend our time focusing on all the things that are wrong, all the things that need to be fixed, and we really lose the beauty and the magic and the mystery of our own bodies and life itself. So I really urge people to begin to try to reframe the conversation that they're having and begin to focus on the things that they appreciate and are filled with gratitude about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie, and thank you, Roy. And uh, before we move on to resources, I just wanted to um, uh, we just wanted to show how you can connect with Melanie and Roy uh, through social media. Um, you can read Melanie's full bio here and follow her on Twitter and Facebook, as well as Roy. Uh, Roy also has a blog, and you can um, uh, watch him on YouTube as well. So please feel free to connect with them. Um, and wanted to go over some of our resources. Um, this uh, past week, last week was Need Awareness Week 2014, and you can still uh, take a look at our needawareness.org site um, for ideas and planning guides for, for next year, hopefully 2015 Need Awareness Week. We'd love to have you all involved, but there's a lot of information on there, um, webinars, infographics, and, and more about eating disorders, so please feel free to check that out. And stay tuned for 2015 Need Awareness Week, which is always the last week of March. Um, and then, uh, sorry, last week of February, not March, last week of February. And then we have our Parent, Family, and Friends Network publication, Making Connections. And that's under the Media tab um, on the NIDA site, www.myneda.org. And there's an article. Um, in the latest issue of the I Am a Girl campaign article that has to deal with the uh, media images, which you might find interesting. Um, as always, we have our PFN webinar series under the Media tab of the NIDA site as well. Our annual NIDA conference is coming up, Thinking Big, Uniting Families and Professionals in the Fight Against Eating Disorders. And that will be in October, October 16th through the 18th in San Antonio this year, so please feel free to join us. And there are scholarships available. You can find out more information on that on the news site as well. Uh, Gerd's books, 
Uh, it's a great resource, uh, www.bulimia.com. There are uh, publications and books about eating disorders that you can check out. Also, Mita has a, the Media Watchdog program, which works to improve media messages about size and weight and beauty by empowering consumers to advocate for change. So please, um, you can get involved in that, um, and you can uh, find that on the Get Involved section of the Mita site as well. Um, as far as getting help, Mita's information and referral helpline, 1-800-931-2237. Um, as well as the click to chat option. We have trained helpline volunteers um, who are willing to and, and able to help you with treatment referrals and information um, as well. So, and also we have our NIDA Navigators program. And these are volunteers who have personal experience with an eating disorder, either themselves or in support of a loved one. And if you would like to connect with a NIDA Navigator, Email uh, pffnetwork at mynita.org, and we would be happy to connect you with the NIDA Navigator. Um, we have our NIDA Toolkit, including the Parent Toolkit, Educator Toolkit, and the Coach and Athletic Toolkit. These offer uh, comprehensive information about eating disorders, treatment options, how to support your child, insurance issues, and much, much more. So please. Um, check those out. Those are on the NIDA site as well. And I'm happy to uh, mention that we have a new media literacy toolkit on uh, the Media Watchdogs program tools. And we have that thanks to a partnership with the University of California Northridge professor Bobby Eisenstock and her students. So if you'd like to learn more about media literacy, um, please check out that new, new toolkit. We're very excited to have it. So I just want to, um, again, thank Melanie and Roy for taking the time today to share their knowledge and their experience um, and to educating us um, a little bit about uh, the media and, and the images that we see every day. Um, and if you have ideas for future webinars, please uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can email me, Ellen, at edomingos at nationaleatingdisorders.org. But thank you again to Melanie and Roy. It was so great um, having you with us today. Uh, and thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. Thank you so much for having us. It was a pleasure and uh, always wonderful to work with Roy. So thank you. Same here, Melanie. Thank you very much. You're the brains of this operation when it comes to us being <laughs> a couple and you're comparing us. And you're the I magician. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I provide wow factor. It's I do, yeah. <laughs> but you're definitely the brains of the operation. It was been my pleasure. Oh, great. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you all at the next uh, PFN webinar. Thank you for joining us. Bye.